I'm Pamela Portnoy, and no one's okay. Welcome back to No One's Okay. We're back with an amazing guest. Her name is Teresa Catherine. She is an actor, writer, and producer living in New York, always making her own work, always kicking ass, and I'm so excited to have her on today. Hi, Teresa. Hi, what an introduction. I hope I live up to it. Uh, How I know are you? you? <laughs> <laughs> I am doing so well. I'm so happy I get to talk to you. You are my first Zoom guest in studio. Ooh. So like in studio, but also not in studio. And like, it looks I'm like you're honored. in studio. Just look at your self-tape backdrop, just absolutely killing it with a white claw in hand, my kind of woman right here. Mango is the only flavor I drink now because I've discovered it's the best flavor. What about black cherry? Actually, I haven't had black cherry. No? Okay. okay I think so you I'll should give it a shot. I feel like some people either, there's no middle ground with the black cherry. It's either strong like or strong dislike. Okay. I'll keep you posted. Yeah. Let me know. <laughs> so Teresa, tell us about your journey. Like start from the beginning, go to the end. I'm kidding. Just tell us what you want to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so funny. I always felt like I came like late to the game into acting because I didn't start acting until I was a junior in high school. Um, That's so funny I, because I don't consider that to be late at all. Well, like a lot of people I knew were like, well, I've been acting since I was in my mother's stomach. And I was like, well, that's <laughs> cool. I didn't start until I was 16. Monologuing in there. Yeah, just like monologuing in the womb. Um but like a lot of my like friends or like people that I like went to school with were like child actors. And I was like, I, that's, I don't know anything about that. Um, I moved around a lot as a kid. Um, and when we moved to what is now sort of my hometown in Greenville, South Carolina, my mom was like looking for ways to get me involved in extracurricular activities because I was sort of sad that I had like left a group of friends behind in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, and she found out that there was a public arts high school that you could audition to attend and you would spend half of your day at like your home school getting your like core education and then half the day going to this arts school and she was like I think you should audition because I had been dabbling in theater like a theater club in Annapolis um, and it had been sort of like something that was of interest to me so I went and I auditioned um, and I did a horrific monologue and sang Phantom of the Opera and for First, some reason, couple they questions. Me. <laughs> couple questions. One, what song from Fan- Phantom and um, what monologue? Do you remember? So monologue, yeah, I do. The monologue was from a, it was like an educational theater piece that they had done at my previous high school called Bang Bang You're Dead. And it was about school shootings. Wow. Okay. Um, so it was that, like that's the, like such a comedic name for something so morbid so tragic yeah yeah um, so like tragic, the show morbid. was the show was like the victims were like coming to life and speaking to the shooter like in his cell after he's been arrested for shooting up his school um and so I did a monologue by one of the victims and it was like so like stereotypically like over dramatic, had no idea what was doing, got shot and died midway through. Like it was a whole thing. I want to see video of this. This and is- then I sing Phantom of the Opera from Phantom of the Opera. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> I've I've never heard you sing. I didn't know you because I'm not a sing no, I'm not a singer. It was like one of the things where they're just like, play an improv game or like, could you sing for me right now? And I was like, "Mm, sure. But you, do you get in? Obviously. I got accepted. Yeah. But the the Gerard Butler Phantom of the Opera had come out like that previous Christmas and I had been overwhelmingly obsessed with it. Yeah. I I am obsessed with that film too. I'm obsessed with the musical. It's probably my favorite musical. Um, It It is a very good one. Wow. Um, Any chance I could so hear that uh... combo? Oh my well, god, notes? no. You're like, no. <laughs> no, you don't you don't want me to. I would be I would be very offended. <laughs> like other people would be very offended being like this bitch. No. <laughs> so you went to this arts high school. 
so I did this arts high school and then there I was just sort of on a whim I was like I mean I like this I guess I'll go to college for this that sounds good um so I was like if I get in there's two main public universities in South Carolina there's Clemson and there's University of South Carolina Clemson auditions their theater majors University of South Carolina does not so I was like if I got into Clemson because I auditioned like great um you'll notice that there is, I have a bad track record of, of auditioning well because I memorized my audition monologue on the way to Clemson that morning for the audition. That's amazing. I need to know your secrets. And I got in. Um, the Shakespeare monologue, I knew by heart. I was very confident. I love Shakespeare very, very much. Um, but the contemporary monologue, I didn't know at all. I memorized it on the road to Clemson. It's like a 45 minute drive from Greenville to Clemson. Um, and it was a Christopher Durang piece, which is like a really weird fucking choice for an 18 year old to make. And at the audition, they were like, Durang, tell us why you landed on that. And I was like, well, you know, like I tried on a little Noel Coward and then I tried on a little bit of Tennessee Williams and just like Durang fit. And they were like, oh, which is just like, <laughs> he knows her shit. And then I learned, and obviously I learned about Durang and I was like, what a weird choice to make. <laughs> <laughs> what was that one uh, like censored what was it about uh it's from Betty's last summer or Betty's summer vacation okay and it's a girl who's like talking to a man and she's like you're not a serial killer are you that would be hilarious but are you but <laughs> I don't think so but are you do we find out I don't remember I really don't remember <laughs> the play very well <laughs> that sounds freaking hilarious so um I somehow get in and the stars align and tell me you should continue doing this so I continue doing this um that's amazing what was like the moment that you had that really made you feel like you love doing this um I did I loved go I loved my time at Clemson's in the theater department um I had always enjoyed like playing make-believe as a kid and I had like very intricate intense make-believe realms that everyone sort of had to like believe in my world building and everyone had to get on board with the characters and so like from a very young age I was already like telling stories and building worlds so like it was something that was meant to be um mm -hmm. so um I finally like found the way that you could do that and theoretically make money which one day Absolutely. I think will be true for me <laughs> you are always working on something that's try, something that really strikes me it strikes me about you you know I met you what, was, what year was it 2012 11 11 2000 yeah. you're right 2011 and I've always just been struck by your work ethic and every time I like we don't talk that often but every time I like see your Instagram and all your all your stuff you're constantly writing you're constantly producing you're making short films which you just gotten some nominations which are very very exciting including did, a best actress you. nomination fuck yeah <laughs> congratulations I can tell you that started in Clemson because I wasn't getting cast um so you decided to make your own stuff yep um so there was only four of us in my year um and I didn't get cast in anything my freshman or sophomore year. And I was very upset about it. Um, and my best friend in the program and my roommate was a writer director. And she was like, I mean, we could do, I could direct something. So uh, as a sophomore in college, I was like producing my own work. Um, and I've sort of kept that energy up. And I remember very distinctly in college, they were like, you're going to have to make your own work because you're not going to be cast consistently. And I was like, I'm going to show up at New York and they're going to be like, oh, we've been waiting for you. You're just <laughs> I'm here to solve all your problems. <laughs> Turns out that's not how it works. But well, it's so important people, to have that not attitude for me. though, which I fucking love that you have because it's so crucial. Um, and then I eventually made it to New York in 2015 and I was like, oh, ho, there are so many people here. And they know so much more than me. And seeing as I don't sing, that knocks out a good section of Broadway right from the start. I I think you're phenomenal. And I think that you're, you've got the drive, which is like such a crucial element. Thank so, you. Um, it's amazing. I, I describe it as like the, the, the true 
Gryffindor within me. Um, and like, there's this sort of like, (laughs) there's this sort of energy where I just sort of like, I'm like, we're just going and we're saying, suck it and we will figure it out as we do it. And the most- That's one of my favorite things. I think that's um, a Tina Fey quote. It's uh, say yes and then figure it out afterwards. I can distill it to like the the clearest moment of, I recently moved um, from downtown to uptown uh, New York and uh, we we rented a 15 foot U-Haul and I picked up the U-Haul and I was like, I will drive it myself to the apartment and it will be great. And I got in the U-Haul and I started to drive. And then I realized that the um, side view mirrors were not adjusted so that I could see. So it was just like looking at the ground. And my boyfriend was like, how did you not check the mirrors before you got into the 15 foot U-Haul. And I was like, I mean, <laughs> it's my go-getter attitude. And my, courage. I was like, we're doing this. And then I discovered halfway through, we were missing some significant pieces, but we were going to make it all the same. Amazing. And so after you adjusted the mirrors, I'm assuming you pulled over and, and fixed it. Oh, no, no, no. I go in all the way to my apartment and I knocked over a um, stop sign in the process, but, um, I, I like I'm successfully it. moved and living in my new apartment so I really okay. need a little bit of that I, I badly need a little bit of that um that attitude that it's going to be okay instead of everyone slow down slow down because I can feel that a mistake is looming it's gonna I happen have that. I have that a lot um last summer I like used some of my like unemployment money to hire she doesn't like to be called a life coach, but she was a life coach. And we like worked on like dismantling my perfectionism. So some of that energy peeks through a little bit more because I spent some time with her, like tearing down the walls of like, sometimes it can't all be a hundred percent perfect. And you're just going to have to figure out that that's okay. That's amazing. I'm so interested in that. What's the, what's kind of been, has that been your main focus in your sessions with her? Yes. Um. So we, I mean, she's also an actress. So we, we talked about um, like living in New York and what that's like and how to sort of navigate that successfully and not um, succumb to what she likes to call compare and despair. Um, I love that. Yes. <laughs> which like, yes, is so true and so real. And um, I sometimes have to like take like social media purges where I like can post something and then I get off and I'm not allowed to scroll because I can't, I like want, it's so it's it sounds terrible like I want to be so happy for everyone else's successes but then I just like feel like but like I'm working really hard where is my booking where is my thing and I'm like well they're not for you they're for them that's why they got them they're not yours right and I think a lot of the reason why so many people feel that like comparison and desperation I totally like Mm -hmm. wrecked it because it doesn't rhyme when I say it like that (laughs) but I feel like people have that because they're not they're in like a mindset of, I don't even want to say scarcity because that might sound too harsh, but it, the truth is there's enough room for everybody. Totally. And just because you don't get an audition or a job that you were hoping to get doesn't mean that you're not good. It just means you weren't that character. And I've, but that's hard to wrap your I'm head like around. Sometimes. Finally, I'm get finally it. coming around to understanding that but it's really hard. Yeah. Um, but like, I finally, like I had an audition for a role that I didn't book. And then like my boyfriend happened to know the boyfriend of the girl who did book it. And he was like, look at her. She looks nothing like you. And she like has pink hair and Mm -hmm. is like very voluptuous and like very sexy. And I was like, oh, if that's the look they were going for, I was never going to book that. That's not me. Yeah, it's always just, it's someone that's bringing something completely different to the table, you know? Right. But that so doesn't just mean like, what I you're mean, bringing like, isn't great. If that's, if that's what they were looking for, I could have been the most amazing actress in the world. They still don't want me because I'm not what they were looking for. For sure. Absolutely. Once I cracked my second claw. Oh, hell yeah. Cheers. Huzzah. <laughs> she came ready. <laughs> I love well, I actually it. just texted my sister and I said, can I please have another white cloth? <laughs> Did she secretly <laughs> hand you one? And she secretly handed me one and here we are. Hi, is this, um, is this your sister who is an incredibly talented costume designer? She is, yes. N- nice. She does um, a lot of the wardrobe for your films, right? 
She exclusively does the wardrobe for my films, yes. She also Fabulous. does DP. Amazing. And if I'm not mistaken, was she acting opposite you in, in one of your fight choreography? No, that's a, that's a friend of mine who, um, they are of a similar stature, so I can understand if you thought that, that was Got her. it, got it, got it. I was, I was watching both- a bunch of your stuff this week. <laughs> Including your latest short film, which was really fun. Really Thank fun. Thank you. I, I could feel your love for what you what you do, just like coming out of the screen. Thank you. That's You're exciting. You're so welcome. Um, so I want to hear a little bit about what you, what you do on the day-to-day. Um, I know you have your own production company called Made I Marian do. Productions. It's called Made in Prince Productions. Made in Prince, sorry, Made in Prince. That's You're okay. Right. Oh my god, I knew it. And that you know how but Made I Marian is correct. Product? Made Marian because that's um, the, name the name of, of your pup, right? right? Yes. Okay. See? So it's Made in Prince because our dogs are named after Maid Marian and Prince Philip. Because my sister's Pomeranian is Philip, so that's okay. How Made I'm in gonna Prince let to myself oh, slide on that. I was close. <laughs> you were very close. I'm not. I do close. not fault you for that. Um, so yeah, tell me a little bit about what you've been working on and, and your day to day. Um, well, as a New York actor, you have to have a side hustle and I have multiple side hustles. Um, I know I just learned about one tonight for the first time. I didn't know you had an in-office job as well. Yes. Well, I don't post that on my social media cause it's, um, I work for a criminal defense attorney in New York. Um, I like assist in running their social media and I run their like office management and their billing. So it's not very glamorous. Um, that's not really that, bad. Not that the though. other things I do is glamorous, but, um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's great. Um, it, uh, it's more steady than some of my other previous side hustles. So it's nice to like, and it was fully remote. So I was never unemployed last year, like fully. I was only partially unemployed. So that was a blessing. Um, yeah. So I had something to busy myself um, while I lost my mind in quarantine. So I do that um, three days a week. And then I'm also a bar instructor. And I actually just got hired today to be a solid core coach. So I'll be teaching two different types of fitness classes. Yeah. Um, yes. Congratulations. Thank you. And then... Um, so I recently, so I started, you're right. I started made in print in January of this year. Um, so on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, I don't work the office and I try to schedule my days to write. I'm in post for a short, so I'm working on editing that um, and then writing my next short film, maybe feature, I can't decide. Um, Ooh. Have you done a feature length project yet? No. Um, I've done two, two seasons of a web series mm-hmm. and three shorts. Um, is it time and for that? I think it might be time. I want, I would well, love to see a Teresa feature. So I really, I really wanted the, this current short to be like my like production company's calling card. It's called Rocket Women. Um, but I've hit a little bit of a snag in music rights um because i did not realize they were so intricately annoyingly complicated On top of it? really yeah. um and i like already filmed everything with the music in the film mm. so like there's no way to take it out um and i am not looking to refilm it um so i think that my next project will be the project that i like pin my hat on to be like this is the thing my production company does and I would like to like do it big for the first time because my my first two shorts with the production company have been shot on my iPhone which is great quality but I'm looking to go bigger and better hell yeah that's so exciting do you have a rough idea of what it's going to be about or are you not ready to share I can share um it's called no one likes a mad woman um, which is a Taylor Swift um, call out because I love Key Swift. Um, yes. Oh my God. Mad Woman's a great song. It is. That is my favorite from folklore. Um, really? Mm-hmm. I feel like I we could it. do a whole other episode on Taylor Swift's um, folklore and um, the album that Evermore. came after that. Yeah, Evermore. Evermore, which is what my ring says because I love it so much. Um, Amazing. Yeah, I could deep dive Taylor Swift all day. 
I, I literally, when, um, when, uh, the first one came out. What what's going on with my brain? Like I'm I forgot the second one now, I'm forgetting the first one. Um <laughs> folklore came out. I um literally turned off the lights in my living room. I lit all these candles and I poured myself a glass of whiskey and I just like listened to it from beginning to end. And it, that was a magical evening, I have to say. Were you a Taylor Swift fan before folklore? I absolutely was. And um I really like the Reputation album. I know like a lot of mm-hmm. Taylor Swift fans, like that's not their favorite, but I think it was mine. And then um, Folklore came out and it was exactly the mood that needed to happen in that space in time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fabulous. I'm with so, you. Um, no One Likes a Mad Woman. So yes, it's called No One Likes a Mad Woman, tentatively. Um, it, it takes place during the Salem Witch Trials. Um, yes, <laughs> yes, and um, I really this is a call out if there are any DPs or ADs out there who have an interest or knowledge in horror films, I'm looking for you. Hell yeah, I really want this film to have the energy of a horror film without being a horror film. Excellent. I know that there are some DPs that listen, so hopefully you guys um, hit Teresa. So if you're in the, in the fear in the tri-state area, I want to work with you. Um, so I really want this, I want this film to have the energy of a horror film with there being no horror and no like supernatural things, because I think the terror of what a human does to another human is the ultimate terrifying. Um, so the pieces, like the two main characters are Honor and, Le- and Eliza. Eliza has been arrested and is going to be burned for being a witch because of a rumor honor made that was not intended to go so far she like sort of said something offhanded as in like out of jealousy and fear and Eliza is paying the ultimate price for it now amazing so that the film takes place the morning the morning of Eliza's execution and honor has come to be like I'm really sorry, please forgive me. Um, and Eliza first is like, fuck you. Um, and then eventually says, well, if you take my daughter away from here, I'll forgive you. But wow. she can't live as the daughter of a witch because it's too horrific of a life for a girl to have. Right. Um, and so that's that the basis of it. Probably start bringing her up as a suspect next. Exactly. Um, so I'd like it to take place like not directly in Salem because there's a lot of like baggage that comes with that um but sort of like some Massachusetts colony just outside of Salem that um you know was like a god-fearing uh town that burned a woman alive for no reason fucking crazy I listen to those stories all the time because I love uh lore podcasts have you listened to lore I have not I feel like you would really, really like it. Um, it's produced um, and hosted by Aaron Mankey, and he's an unbelievable. Um, okay. It, the podcast is unbelievable. And they made like it like L O R E. Yeah. And they actually made a TV show based on that podcast. I don't know oh, how cool. many seasons it had, but it, it was, it's just so fascinating, all these stories. But they talk a lot about the Salem Witch Trials. But I really want to talk about like that, like female on female aggression that exists. Yeah. And just how like damaging your words can be, even if you don't mean it. And sort of like the ramifications that you have to deal with, even if you didn't mean what you said, or like, even if you didn't really know what you were saying, like spreading fake news is detrimental. And um, we lived that last year, but um, I think people continue to live it today. Um, And I think that was very real for them. It reminds me of a story I heard a long time ago. Um, it was a lesson about gossip and it was, they were asking like, what does gossip really do? And they're like, okay, do me a favor, go grab a pillow, a feather pillow. Oh, like open it up and let all the feathers fly away. And they're like, okay, I did that. Now Mm -hmm. what? Now go collect all the feathers. That's basically what gossip is. I've always, that always kind of resonated with me because you're never really 
you never really know like where everything is going to land at the end. And in a case like this, it's somewhere super tragic. Right. Exactly. Um, Yeah. I just think that, I think that like, I think we're doing a lot better now. I definitely think that maybe as like teenagers, maybe you can speak to this, that like girls having girls backs wasn't as much of a thing. Mm -hmm. And there was sort of like this energy of like women can succeed, but only one. So fight for that place at the table, ladies. And so then you just like undercut women and that's no more empowering than if there was just no seat at the table for a woman. Yeah, I know. It's super damaging. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, that sounds like a very exciting project. Are you going to be playing Eliza? I am playing Eliza. How'd you know? I just, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I thought that would be right. I'm very excited to see it whenever you do um, finish it. You. I'm very also interested in like a non-traditional cast. Um, like I'd love a multi-ethnic Salem. I don't give a shit about historical accuracy. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. We were having a conversation about that recently. Um, because of Bridgerton, have you seen it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Love it. Yeah, it's fantastic. I thought it worked beautifully. Oh, I think it was perfect. Um, yeah. And I think if the essence of the character is there, then it doesn't fucking matter whether what the character looks like. Like if the S, if like the nature of the character lives within, then it doesn't matter. Absolutely. You're either the person or you're not the person. Right. Um, and like part of my production company is energy and, and some of like the things that I'm really interested in are that um, like my mission statement is that we are a space for female identifying stories to be told and female identifying being anyone who identifies as she, her. And that every production I do will have a 50% female cast and crew. Um, The story will be either written, directed, or starring a woman. I Um, love this. So, um, and then eventually I'm still like a baby and I only do my projects right now, but eventually we're going to do at least one project a year that highlights an underrepresented story. Amazing. That that's wonderful. I'm so happy you're doing that. And you're, you're just such a hard worker and so talented. And I'm so excited to see what you continue to make. Thank you. Um, what, I, I had another question before I move on to our next segment. What yes. what drives you? What keeps you motivated and grinding? Because I've been finding, you know, there are days where I feel super motivated and like I can't stop working and doing mm-hmm. things. And then sometimes I just, I just like burn out and then I have to stop. Like ha- what keeps you consistent? Um... So I recently started what I was finding when I first um, founded Made in Prince is that I was like, there's too much work to do. I can never stop working. So I was working like my two like paying jobs plus this production job, like nonstop. I was never taking a break. I was working till like 10 o'clock at night because I was like, the website has to get up and I have to make my social media and I have to like plan my things. And I was burnt out. And so what I started doing was I schedule my days now, like down to the hour to be like, from 10 to 11, I will do edits for Rocket Women. And from 12 to 1, you're taking a lunch break. And then from 1 to 2, you're going for a run. And then you're coming back to and you're doing edits. And so I break down Monday through Friday, like 8 to 6, like that. And then I have the freedom to move it as I need to. But all of those things need to get done at some point that week. Um, mm-hmm. Because I found if I was just generically like on Tuesdays, From noon to six, I do production work. Then I would like sit down and be like, well, there's so much production work. Like, where do you start? And then I would did nothing for like three hours, like debating what would be the best thing to do. That, so I'm finding that to be very helpful, but I will also say in the same breath, um, I haven't touched um, Rocket Women for like, today was the first day I touched Rocket Women in like three weeks because I like, found some disheartening information out and then I was just like I can't touch it I'm too sad 
<laughs> I understand. So then so, there's like a feeling there's associated about- with it. And you're like, maybe if I step away for a second, that feeling will go away. Definitely. And just today it was like, you have to finish it. You started it. We're finishing it and you'll figure it out. Get a little of that suck it energy going and let's do this. Put on your red and gold cape and, and go for it. Exactly. Amazing. So a balance. Yeah. I think that that's super helpful. You know, I, I try to plan out my days, but I feel like I don't do it thoughtfully enough. So like, I'll have it written down, like the things that need to get done on a certain day. But then I'm like, why did I schedule that for 11? That was dumb. And then like, I don't end up doing it. (laughs) I need, I think I need to be more thoughtful about like, and realistic about how I function. That's also why I started doing it digitally, which I've never done before because on GCAL, you can just drag it to a different time. So I just move, if I don't like it, I'm just like, I'm not doing that now. I move that. Um, Okay. So I'm, I'm finding that I don't like it to being digital because I find that I forget things if I don't like physically write it down. Um, But it makes me move it rather than just like cross it out. So it keeps me conscious of it. Three side gigs, a production company, plus auditions, plus your personal life. Like what personal life? I know you have a personal life. (laughs) Yeah. It's small. It's uh, over in the corner. um, It's really easy that when you kind of zoom out to, for, to be overwhelmed by all that. Totally. So I think that's, those are really good words of wisdom. Just stay organized and scheduled. I mean, my type A personality will have it no other way. (laughs) Beautiful. Um, I want to move on if you're cool with it to my next Please. section, which I'm trying out. I don't know how our listeners are going to respond. Um, I did this with my last guest, Jason, and I'm going to do this again. Great. We're going to do silly questions that we're going to take super seriously. Okay. <laughs> okay. What is your favorite weapon for stage combat? I love the quarter staff. Um, can for our listeners that don't know what the quarter staff is, yes, I'm sorry, explain? because I don't, I can't picture it in my head and I'm embarrassed. That's okay. Because <laughs> no, this is normally what I tell people it is what Gandalf uses in Lord of the Rings. It is a long stick for which you hit people with. Um, you can also think of Ray from the most recent um, Star Wars trilogy. She also has a quarter staff. And what is it about it that just like gets you fired up? It's, um, is fun to whip around. Um, you, I mean, the the worst damage you're gonna do is like hit somebody in the head, but I'm not gonna like cut anybody with it. So there's a little more fuck it energy about it because you can sort of like whip it around in such a way that like, I'm not gonna do lasting damage to someone. Um, it's fun, it's fast. Um, you can do all sorts of crazy nonsense with it. When I tested out, um, which is what you do when you are, um, stage combat you have to like you have to train for x number of hours and then you have to like show your proficiency in the weapon to someone and then they say yes you're good or like yes you're really good or get the fuck out of here don't touch that weapon ever again um (laughs) you're not really cut out for this you're hurting yourself get the hell out of here (laughs) um you can do sort of like acrobatic stuff with it so my partner and I did like a puck uh, not puck um over on Titania scene Ooh. And at one point we lost one, one quarter half staff. So, so we had one between the two of us and we're like facing each other and we like, you pull it down and then you can like flip somebody over your back by holding the quarter staff and you can like whip them up and over. So oh that's what God. I got to do. Um, so oh you can God. do all sorts of fun things with quarter staff. Um, I'm like getting like flashbacks right now of when I was a kid and I was, um, I was a stand in on a television show and during our time off, there was a pool table. And so all the child all the child actors we would like play pool together and I fucked up so bad I I was I must have been like seven or eight I wasn't looking when I was making my shot Mm -hmm. and I poked another one of the kids in the (laughs) eye I'm pretty sure I gave him a black eye it was a total accident I felt so bad so this idea of a quarter staff like I feel like I should either master it or just like don't don't even try it's so good though. Like I lost a fingernail um, when I tested out of rapier dagger. So I'm a little afraid of rapier dagger. Um, but quarter staff is amazing. I can't recommend it enough. You almost never use it, but I love it. 
I have my own that. quarter staff so cool. too. Like that's how much I love it. Really? Does it have like a neat design on it? Nope. It's very plain. It's very like average. Um, but uh, it's literally like someone went into the woods and found a stick that they're like, this is good. And they sanded it down. And <laughs> This will do. <laughs> but it's the weapon I tested out with because I practiced with it. So I left Don't her. fuck with Teresa, you guys. I'm sure that she lunges for that uh, quarter staff every time you hear like a weird like noise in the apartment. I'm ready. You're ready. <laughs> I love that so much. Very good answer. Okay. Chocolate or sour candy? Chocolate. Excellent. Best hype up music. Uh, Ariana Grande. Very good. Uh, favorite play or musical you've seen in person? Oh God, that's so hard. Um, and to be fair, it's not really a silly question, but I just want to know. Um, I saw a live production of How I Learned to Drive with um, Norbert Leo Butts. And I haven't it seen was, that one. I, have, I don't the, think I've even read it. So it was the first time I understood that maybe Uncle Peck is not the like trash human being I thought he was in the, in the play. Um, it was like the very first time I ever considered the play from another person's point of view because I'd only ever considered it from Little Bit's point of view. Interesting. Um, it was a really so, powerful moment. That's sort of how I felt about, I've seen Phantom in person probably upwards of seven times. <laughs> mm-hmm. And there was one particular um, showing of it that I saw in LA, the Pantages, and the Chris, scene that was performing this piece was so was interpreting it in a way that I've never seen it like Mm -hmm. I usually there's a there's a scene where I think she's on the roof and she's I forget what song it was but she in this show had a moment where oh my god she's she's thinking about jumping like she's contemplating Mm -hmm. suicide it was like a way darker gorier bloodier yeah. version than I was used to seeing in previous productions and I was like holy shit I never thought about it that way so I love when performers do that to you yeah that's amazing um I had another one. Oh yes here we go last one <laughs> cherry orchard or the seagull oh the seagull excellent is that the one you did when we met yeah we were both Masha we're both Masha. That's right. We were two of four Mashas. <laughs> Freaking amazing. Very good. Very good. And I remember there was a seagull made out of towels. Very good. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> um, Teresa, where can our listeners follow you? What are you working on? Plug, 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 plug. Um, I am, I have two uh, profiles on Instagram. Teresa Catherine that's Catherine with a C not a K and a Teresa with no H um and then my production company made in Prince Productions um I one day will finish Rocket Women which is the short that I shot in March I know Um, you will absolutely it's mostly just like me dragging my feet about it that's it there's nothing else holding me back you've been making shit during the past year and a half which is like so well, I'm making huge since October. <laughs> I made jokes on you. I filmed that in October. That's the one that's having a, a pretty solid festival run right now. Um so exciting. We just got our fifth acceptance was today. Um Congratulations. And our second award. Thank you. Um I sort of like am tempting fate. At first I was like, I can't share this with people. And my boyfriend was like, why? And I was like, Well, it's like a DC fan film. So like I don't know if like DC's gonna have a problem with that he's like I mean if DC has a problem with that then like that's more press for you so that's good so absolutely can you imagine we said we said fuck it and we threw it to the wind and we started submitting to a bunch of things and a bunch of people were like I don't hate this so that's nice I really enjoyed it I thought you were spectacular and it was super creatively done thank you and it was very much like how do we successfully create something in quarantine and not get close to anyone and everyone feel safe but everyone feel like they created something yeah absolutely congrats thank you so jokes on you is up on instagram um rocket women will one day 
be birthed into the world. Um, yay. <laughs> and then um, No One Likes a Mad Woman is on the horizon. Fuck yeah, I can't wait. That's so exciting. Teresa. Pamela. Are you okay? I'm better than okay. Yes. Tell me why. What's going on? Um... I don't believe in a lot of like woo woo energy, but I legitimately think all the good news I got today is because I finally sat down and was like, universe, I want the things that I want. And I'm going to show you by working on my film for the first time in a month. And the universe was like, you know what? I see you. Here's your job offer. And here's an <laughs> award for your short film. And you get to see Pamela tonight. And I was like, thank you. That makes me so happy. That is that is so wonderful and you absolutely deserve it and all the good things are coming your way I just know it and they're gonna continue to thanks lady you're so welcome thank you so much for joining me today of course thank you for having me of course oh my god it's always so good to see you and I just want to tell my listeners you guys that you will see uh, Teresa on another episode coming out real soon because based on which is my adaptation podcast is going to be on this channel. So you're going to see her very soon as well. We tackle, should I tell them what we tackle? Totally. It's my favorite. We tackle Harry Potter 3. Ow, ow. Very exciting. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me again. You guys follow her. She's amazing. I was so happy to see you. Hey, lady. Have a good night. Thank you. And we will see you you guys next time. (laughs) Bye. This podcast was produced by Jason Crow and me, Pamela Portnoy, with music by Jordan Ross Weinhold. You can follow the show on Instagram and Facebook at No One's Okay. And please don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We love kind reviews. No One's Okay is also on YouTube. So if you want to see our faces, please subscribe to our channel. An extra special thank you goes out to Sean Moore, Claire Palmer, Jackson Palmer, Tiffany Hamoff, and Alexa Marie Anderson. This podcast was recorded at Soundworks Studios. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.